All right. Sorry about that. Almost done. So yeah, take, um, take take your time, man. Take your time. What are you eating? What are you eating, by the way? I just finished this. I've had it open for a long time. Finally, RX bar's done. Done, so. Are you still eating the protein bar, man? What the? They're, f they're, they're it hard took to. You one one hour to eat the protein bar. What's well, going it's, on? It's a chewy protein bar. All right, well, let's. You're already in live chess, so let me invite you to the. Uh, to the analysis board, okay? Mm -hmm. Yep. And we'll go over. We don't even need to spend a ton of time on it. We can do some other things, but I thought we could go over um, your your games, just the ones that you just played at, at, at uh, your first round. And again, I know I said this in Discord afterwards, man, but psychologically i want you to know i don't you know i think you're in a pretty good place because you're you're working hard you, you just played the person who seems to clearly be like the favorite in your bracket right we didn't know that ahead of time but now we kind of know that i think waga is probably the favorite so i think the battle to be one of the top two and move on to the championship bracket i consider you probably the favorite to take that spot to be honest i think i think as long as you stay focused you've already you've already played against the, the highest rated guy and so anyway, I know that's kind of my job to say that as your coach, but how are you feeling right now psychologically? Are you buying what I'm selling here? Like, what do you think? Absolutely, absolutely. I feel I feel good about my chances, you know. I don't really know that much about my opponent, you know, the next two guys. Like, I know like I know who they are, but I don't know their skills in chess. Right. Uh, but, you know, I... I've been working hard. Uh, I like. I'm gonna do my best. That's all I can do, really. Right. Well, I mean, yeah, and and of course, and I think, um, I think you know you're on the right track, as we know. We're doing this for fun, and because chess is awesome and it's challenging. And you and I were talking just a minute ago, right? Chess is one of those games where the more the more you learn, the harder it gets, which is obnoxious, but it just kind of is, right? <laughs> the more you learn, sometimes the the harder it is to continue to. Uh, to deal Progress. with the, the next things and but all right so i'm gonna flip this board on my end so i see it from your point of view i think you're already viewing it from white so that's good so let's let's dive in here so we played a uh Karakon, and this is um a system that a few people are playing in the tournament what you did bishop c4 is actually so remember you play bishop c4 against e5 this is your main weapon it's your italian right but against the C6 game where they're going to play D5, often the best way to take advantage of this is to take the space they gave you, right? They, they play E5 in a main line, and they're directly challenging you. They want to fight for these dark squares you've abandoned. If they, if they play C6, they're kind of conceding the center, and even though it's just the most traditional way to play, often the best thing to do is to play D4. And if they play D5, which they will, I would say we use our space advantage and, and play for E5, and I know the problem with this is this is very off the beaten path for what you've been playing in a um, in an Italian, but it is a little bit different, right? As you saw in the game, when you played Bishop C4, you never quite reach an Italian, and Black actually gets kind of a big center right out of the gate, right? Yeah. Um, so... I don't know that you're going to play the Karo again in this initial bracket, but if you get to the championship bracket, you surely will, and we'll probably have another lesson by then. And what I would say is, at this stage of, of chess evolution, you don't want to develop a style that has preference to, to your open, you know, to your opening too much, because you're you're kind of getting you know consistent with the bishop c4 idea. Most of the time that works, but against other weapons that are not e5. You kind of want to remember the basic principles before the basic moves. And the basic principles are, if your opponent gives you the center, take it. Take it, okay. and, and then ask questions later. Okay. Um, if, 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 if they give it to me, I'll take it. Take it. And, and even to the point where you can do anything here. You can develop the knight next to defend, and you're going to be in a better spot, um, where your bishop will eventually have a square. You can expand fully with e5. And even though it's a different structure than you're used to getting... You can get a c3 kind of French structure, bring your bishop to d3, and try to attack on the king's side. It's it's a hard thing to deal with an opening that's off the beaten path, but the main highlight I wanted to give is if you get the center, just take it, and then develop pieces. 
memorizing principles comes before memorizing moves. And we memorize the Italian because it's an opening that makes a lot of sense against E5. But when someone gives you the center, if it's not the opening you know, go back to principles first and go grab that thing. So, all right, moving on. D5, bishop B3, E5. Now you took it and played D4. I really love that, by the way. That was a great transition. Even though he got a, a, sorry, a space advantage to go with that, that was the right way to handle his big center. Um, I'm going to give you a tip that is... I, I said this in our Discord chat, and this is the first moment in this game where it applies, which is don't be afraid of tension. Don't be afraid of pawn tension. You don't always want to be the one who breaks tension. More often than not, you actually want to be the guy that builds on the tension. Like, you want to bring as much pressure for the water, for the dam to break and everything to rush through. When your opponent has a pawn chain, one of the first plans that should always come to mind is where is the base of that chain? Sometimes the base is all the way back here, and, and the plan might be, oh crap, I don't have enough time to get all the way to that base, you know, if he had a huge pawn chain. But sometimes the base is right in the center. And the move you can often look for as a great way to undermine someone's structure is a move that attacks the base. Because if they ever break, they're always weakening the lead pawn. Like, by definition, if the base pawn falls, the whole chain is weaker. Doesn't mean you win it, but it's, it's better for you. It's more active. This pawn is a target. You can develop naturally. So I, I wanted to just kind of pile on that tip I gave you in Discord that build on the tension when you have an opportunity. You don't need to break it. Um... Okay, I'm going to go quickly. Stop me, by the way, if you have any questions. Be like, yo, Dan, I don't even know, you know, whatever, right? I'm kind of rolling through because I don't, I actually wanted to do some other stuff with you today, but I just wanted to do my due diligence as your coach and at least look at the games quickly. Um, but if I'm going too fast, let me know. It's okay, it's okay. I'm uh, pulling up, just like listening and, and cool. you know, yeah. Cool. Um so we uh, we roll we roll forward knight e two knight f six castles bishop g four this is you're doing great this would have been a really great opportunity instead of developing the knight to attack the base and I'm going to give you a universal tip that'll help you remember this next time because mm -hmm. because one thing that's hard is whenever we start facing all these different openings our coaches are giving us information we're like yeah I'm not gonna you know the position's gonna be different universal principle. Whenever the queen pawn is the lead pawn in the center, so not the king pawn, it's not an e4, e5 game, it's a queen pawn. Anytime the queen pawn is the, is the lead pawn in the center, you want to bring your knight out behind your pawn, not in front of it. And obviously there are exceptions where, okay, we got to pay attention. If somehow playing a pawn move is losing a piece or something, I mean, don't do it. But the philosophical point is that whenever the queen pawns are the lead pawn and you play a move like this, you're always biting granite, meaning there's no breakthrough here. It's well defended. So your pieces are kind of just, they're kind of just looking at a wall, right? And and that was one of the things you ran into in the game was you didn't have a plan because you were like, ah, like nothing to do. And that's why you actually brought the knight over here later. And instead of me making it an exact point of criticism, like Thor, you should have played C4 in this exact position. You might never reach this exact position again. But one thing you can apply to future games is whenever we're in a pawn structure where the queen pawn is the furthest advanced pawn, even if you have a king pawn here supporting the chain, whatever the structure is, if the queen pawn is the lead pawn, this is a game where you need more space. You need to create opportunities for the pressure because the queen is defending the center so well, the knight, the knight by itself is not enough to put pressure in these points. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, it does. Okay, so c4 would have been a good move here. And then then bring the knight out behind the pawn. And if he doesn't break and activate your bishop, which you would have been happy with, you're fine with that because you're just going to bring more pressure. At some point, you're going to be threatening to win the pawn. And now they have to take it. Right? Mm -hmm. So so this is a, a really good universal thing to remember that will help you in case things go wonky in the future. Um so, we have knight bc3, knight c6, bishop g5. This was all good. Loved how you developed here. And then the tip I gave you here was you played knight to b5. That was kind of a move that goes away from the center. Um, honestly, if you had played knight to b5 and then followed up with this move to get c4, as awkward as that looked, that might even been even better than just going, going to b5 and then kind of losing a tempo, right? 
Either way, your plans are going to be greatly improved in future games where the queen's pawns are the lead pawns, because you're going to remember this idea that you got to get your knights up behind your pawns. But this was a real good sign that things had gone wrong, right? You kind of lost the tempo. I know this game got wild later on, and the one thing you did a great job on overall, I already complimented you, was you played super fast. You had a huge time advantage in this game, right? But I, but I think if we had the right plan combined with that time advantage, some way to get more pressure, we really, really would have been doing good. And on that note, even though I criticized not playing C4, the truth is that Waga, Waga played a bad move back here when you pinned this knight because of the pressure here. He needed to do something to defend this pawn, probably bishop E6. But when he didn't do that, you had a few opportunities right here. And even after what happened in the game, to do what? Do you do you see? Let's just go here. Yeah, I'll I'll, I'll tell you. Like, I can definitely like. I don't know why I didn't do it, but I saw it. I saw my opportunity to kill this knight here. Okay. Uh, that would I would weaken his 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 uh, pawn, so I could kill with either either and. That way he couldn't kill with the queen because I would have it protected. Yeah. By either guy. So I I, I, I saw it. I saw it. I would take. He'd probably take or take. You know that's okay. Then I got a pawn for free. I saw it, but somehow in the game I don't know if it's if if, if it's the stress or something. Something else got my attention and I didn't make the move. This I was that was one one probably one of the you know. I was very un unhappy with myself not playing that move because I saw it at some point, um, but I didn't play it. Yeah. Um, well, a couple of pieces. So first of all, the positional stuff we talked about, remember to, to undermine the queen's pawn, that'll help. And the truth is, you kind of had an opportunity there because his base pawn was so weak. But I'll say this, I think I think maybe maybe you were a little nervous, is that possible? Right? It was your first game in the event, right? I think I think maybe you were a little nervous trying to play a little fast. I think so, yeah. I think I was too much thinking about the claw, trying to use that as yeah. uh, my weapon later on in the game. And I kinda of threw the game away because of that. I think my next plan, yes, definitely play like definitely in the like in in in, in, in like the first three, four moves, I should still like I, I should be able to play uh, quite quite fast because nothing is really happening. Yeah. Uh, but you know, later on in the game, really think and and, and, and use my, my time better, especially like if, 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 if the time is on my side and if if I have more time than him, then, then definitely, you know, I should really take a breath and right. look, look, look at the board and just think, okay, Thor, like, like what's the best move yeah. here? What's happening? Um, uh, what pieces is he protecting? What right. pieces am I looking at you know is he is, is this how many how many how many um uh, warriors does he have to protect right. this pawn he has two his queen and his knight okay if i take this knight out then he only has his queen well i have two guys here right protect uh, uh, attacking this pawn that's a win winning 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 position yep um so i should really like try to like like use my brain better in the next game and use my time better and just like see these moves see 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 this and try to even try to um like make sure i have these moves coming up you know yeah and you know i one advice i can give on that is you know well well articulated it is it is a tough process and balance because on the one hand you want to play fast having a time advantage is helpful right use the clock as a weapon rather than rather than it being a disadvantage. You did that great. But there have to be those moments where we have a sense of when to slow down. That, that takes time and experience. But I will say one sort of signal on, on the fact that this could have taken more time and maybe would have found it is that there are, there are a few different moments where we should always take a moment. One of them is whenever there's an opportunity for a trade. And obviously that sounds like, well, obviously Captain Obvious, but not necessarily people think about it like that because people think about it when someone takes them, 
right? But considering the trade you have yourself and just pausing to really think about that. Like we talk about it always. Does a trade give our pieces more squares or less squares? That's the first criteria of whether a good trade is there. And this is a good example of a trade that would have given you more squares by, you know, by definition, the pawn itself is, is a square because it's because it loses defenders. So by eliminating this, you gain more squares available to your pieces. You, you actually probably could have taken with the knight or the bishop in hindsight. It both would have been good. So so that's one criteria. And again, you know, it's going to be a process of you learning and you'll figure out the timing there. But just one criteria that's like, play quickly as long as you know the opening. The moment the first move is made where you don't, just slow down a second. You don't have to take a ton of time there, but that's the first one. The first move that's played that we don't know, whether that happens on move 3 or move 23. We should we should always slow down there. The second moment we should always slow down is the first opportunity for real trades. And this was really it. Because if we go with that criteria, are we gaining more or losing more squares available? We might have seen that a little bit differently, right? And again, I think you were a little nervous. I think you kind of came in with the thought, I'm going to get up on the clock, which was a good thought. And ultimately could have paid big dividends. It was close even down the stretch. And I think you'll find that timing in your next match. Play quickly, but also whenever there's a trade, that's a moment where we can justify slowing down. Um, the third moment that I always tell students at this level where they should where they should always take their time is the first major piece trade, which by, I define that as queens or rooks. When you're deciding, am I going to an endgame or not? Am I trading rooks on an open file? Those are ones that can often be very... Uh, telling in terms as far as conceding something. So you want to make sure you slow down. Um, it's kind of abstract, but a basic way I think about it is if you have a bunch of rooks fighting on an open file, usually when you trade and they take back with the rook, now you can't challenge the file because you've lost your, your helper, your rook, right? So we would never do that. It loses squares unless we have a good reason. We would never trade queens and go into an endgame if we're down material. But if we're up material, we would. So I'm giving you kind of loose parameters, but they're actually very effective if you think about what I would say are... If, I would, if I'm just saying as a coach, I, I want you to play fast, Thor. But if I'm giving you three moments where you should always slow down. It's the first time someone plays a move you didn't know. Doesn't matter how early. Just slow down. Evaluate where you want your pieces. The second moment is the first opportunity for a trade. The criteria we've given. Are we gaining or losing? And just like appreciate that moment. If you're up two minutes, take a minute. Like really, you know, take a full minute. Um, and the third moment is the major concessions. I call them I call them the major concessions, which is either a queen or a rook trade. There are so many other moments where we where you know it takes experience. But if I was giving you three pieces of criteria, that should help, right? And that'll help us to know like, all right, those are the the alarm bells going off. Like those are one of the moments I need to slow down. So I'm going to use that time advantage I've earned. I've earned it. I can take a minute here and slow down. So, all right. So that would be advice for future. Um, we had the opportunity there. He took here, and and here I think we j probably you just forgot that his knight was going to take. It actually ended up working out almost okay for you because the D pawn was still pretty weak later on. But if you had taken with the knight, that would have been better. You don't lose the D4 pawn, and ironically again you're still in a position to get c4 um and open things up so you take with the queen knight takes here and even with his trade you were still in a position to look for the pawn in the live broadcast it was funny you played rook 80 one and hikaru was teasing me because i was saying thor probably should have taken and traded here but hikaru was right that after takes takes if you take you actually lose this pawn in the end so rook a to e1 indirectly is a slight improvement because if you go for that same line in the end, if they take your pawn, you win the e4 pawn. So um, you went for a deep line there. He defends. But okay, like really it all centers around this point. And, it, and whether it was earlier where you could have taken and then and then won the pawn or whether it's here, um, you know, not handling this guy when you had the chance was kind of was kind of where you lost it. And... Um, even here, it would have been okay for you because in the end of this line, by the way, he can't take because you have you have a very good move here. Can you see it? Yeah. Um, yeah, you got it. Nice C seven. Boom. Yeah. So, um, so for whatever reason, it, it almost felt like in the game we were watching, it almost felt like because you didn't go for the pawn earlier, it was like. You kind of mentally just didn't didn't um, didn't go back to the idea, but in hindsight, being as twenty twenty as possible, just you know, 
take that pawn, right? It was there for the taking. Evaluate this exchange that it gives you more options. Go for it. And I think he, you would have been, honestly, at this point, you were already up like two and a half minutes on the clock. If you had gone for this, I would, I would have said you were the favorite to win the game because you've won your pawn back. He has to play something like this or something to defend, you know, and you're in good shape. You've got a great night. Like you're in a great spot. Um, that was, this was, this was the big moment right here. Absolutely. I felt like the first game, even though, yeah, I felt like I should have, have won the first game for sure. Uh, and in the pool, like it, it's, I, I, it's the past, you know, I don't like to talk like it, the game went like it went, you know, I did some mistakes. You live and learn and right. the next match I'm going to do better for sure. For sure. And do, but do you feel like the points I'm giving you feel like things you can apply to future games there? Absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. Great points. Great. Great. All right. Absolutely. Now, what's funny is after this, you kind of get in <clears throat> all in mode because Queen E3 blundered the piece. So you kind of go for the attack, and I loved it. Unfortunate for you, he just kind of found all the best moves. He really did. Like, he, he found Knight H5, which was a really good move. And then G6, and, you know, you, you went all in here. I love this tactical idea, but, you know, objectively, you were already down a piece, and so probably we're going to lose. Yeah, queen d1 here was the one you said afterwards. You really wish you hadn't traded queens, right? That was bad. I should have done this. Well, not right away, because he's attacking your queen, but you can move your queen oh, first, and then, you're, and then you can do this. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed, agreed. And if we go to my criteria... Always sounds like I'm oversimplifying chess, but doing it for critical thinking, strengths and muscles. The third moment I said we should always slow down is before we make our first offering of a major concession. That means a major trade, queens or rooks. Yeah. And this would have been a moment where we could have slowed down because in hindsight, you knew right away as soon as you did it. I'm down a piece and this gives away my attack, right? Definitely didn't want to do that. It was, it was a terrible move. Like I was so mad at myself. I was just like, the moment I did it, I was like, why did I do that? Like, I just like I, I I gave the game away from me. I was actually I was pressuring him a lot. It was it was it's actually going well. He was like in a in a in a tough position. He was panicking at the time, and then I just I gave the gave the game away. I was just like, why did I do? It was just like a I don't know like a yeah. pressure thing or something, you know. But I was actually super super unhappy with myself with that specific move because okay. that basically just in my opinion because like he was. He was like low on time, yep. exactly at that point. Mm -hmm. And like I know, like with like he, him under pre like he was under some pressure here. And I yep. feel like I feel like if I would have just kept the pressure and kept him thinking for his move moves more, he he might have cracked. Yeah, he might have cracked. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but because I made this silly blunder, uh, he was just like, hey, whoa. Like if I just take this queen, this pressure is gone, yep. and I can get my extra queen down here, or like, or like try try to get it at some point by just doing this or something, and then you know, try well, to uh, like I don't know. Like you said, something. live and learn. I mean, again, you were despite you know we've had a lot of good learning points from the game already, but I agree with you. If you had played a move that keeps the tension still very dangerous for him. He was getting under time pressure. I think anything could have happened, and it felt like the momentum definitely left with Queen D1. So I think... But okay, we've taken away notes of how we're going to manage our time definitely in the future, because I, I, I really don't want you to, to slow down too much. I think you're... A you know, you think quickly, you trust yourself, you should do these things. And that's why I tried to give you that, that kind of check-down list of, at these moments for sure, I will at least slow down. And that'll help, because often you're evaluating those critical moments... When you're considering exchanges or queen trades, like I said. So that'll help. Lesson learned. I think you're right. If you had kept the pressure, this would have been very hard for him. And it really is. Like, I mean, you've got pressure here. It's it's dangerous. And he would have had to find right moves to defend. So after the trade, and then he offered another trade, it just gets harder and harder to hold. And, you know, now the the B pawn is just so strong. I, I think I think even here. You, you still could have slowed down a little bit. I think you were already kind of mad at yourself for, for trading queens, yeah. so you took here. But if you had if you had held on a little bit, maybe defend your rook, 
I was I was showing a line like this, I think, on the broadcast. If he trades, which he might have, you get a double attack, and then you win the pawn back. And you're only down a piece, right? Something like this is only a knight in the endgame, and he was also under time pressure. So remember that very often, Qu Queen one was a big mistake, and I'm not, you know, devaluing Wag Wagamama's skill to say that, you know, he wasn't going to win the game if you don't play no. Rook takes B2. But the truth is, uh, if you hadn't, it was still hard for him, and he might not have, right? And he was just as nervous as you. It was his first game. So remember when you make a mistake, very often the next moves will be mistakes if you don't, like, let it go, right? It's often not the first thing that goes wrong that is the final nail, you know? It's the it's kind of the hangover, the hangover from how we feel about it. And it's easier said than done, but you were still doing okay. And, and I think Rook takes B2 was the second move, along with Queen D1, where you just... Played a little too fast and use your time advantage that you've earned to slow down a little bit, and you'll actually you'll make it a lot harder for them. Um, also, uh, here's another just really great psychological reason to slow down. The easiest moves to calculate if you're uh, put yourself in your opponent's shoes, even if you're under time pressure. What move do you want them to play? A move that gives you an only move to recapture, right? You want them to play moves like this because it's because you're just gonna take. You're not even gonna think, right? The, every move you play when your opponent's under time pressure that's subtle, that gives them something to think about, is actually much harder to deal with. So when you've got that time advantage, even if you know you're worse, it's time to slow down a little bit and think, how do I keep this position as confusing as possible? The more unclear it is, the better. The more you make the obvious checks and trades, you're actually you're making the time pressure easier. Right. In addition to the fact that it's not the best move, so that's another tip that'll help you remember and use your time advantage. Cool. So then we got this, and you know, at this point, you you played as fast as you could, but the truth is, it was already already out, and so we'll we'll leave this one behind. I'm I'm gonna invite you over to um to the second one. We don't have to spend as much long on it. Just real quick. I'm inviting you now to the second analysis board. And uh, we'll roll through over there. Absolutely. Um, <sighs> okay, cool. So here we had a queen spawn game. Yeah. <clears throat> and like the advice I gave you, in the other one, which is whenever the queen's pawns are the ones leading the way, right. think about your pawn chain, and we want to get this knight out behind the pawn or in front of it? Uh -huh. Behind, right? We want to uh, play moves like this. Yes, yeah, absolutely. And get the knight out behind the pawn. Mm -hmm. So, this gives us a great opportunity to get space on the queen side. What you did was also good here. You developed the knight, you made the trade. This was very, very close to equal and good. I'm just trying to remind you again, for any time in the future, if a queen's pawn is the lead pawn, playing Try this move and getting that knight out behind it is great. Mm -hmm. Okay. So bishop b3, we traded. Castles, castles, b6. This was very good and equal. The only real highlight I wanted to give you was from here, which you already know from our Discord combo. Great play up to here. Like, seriously, I, I said you could have played C5 on move 4, which is true, but what you did was great. All good up to here, and now let's remember. Let's focus on building tension using our new knowledge we have of pawn chains rather than this move here. This is just kind of a one-off move that that it's too much of an if. Too much of a if if he blunders, it works out, right? We really don't want to want to do that because, you know, we only go for things like that when we feel like we lack a plan. And and I think now we're trying to learn about pawn structures so so we can always have a plan. Um. And uh, just got a, a small raid. Thank you to Jose Herrera. Appreciate that, man. Um, welcome, welcome, viewers. We got a lesson with Hofdor here. And uh, rock and roll. Guys? Yeah, buddy. We are. We are. Yeah, we are. <laughs> Alright, so C5. This is the move. This is the move. Get the knight yeah. out behind the pawn. Absolutely. And, um... Uh, 
Um, yeah, c5 and, and knight c6 there. Mm -hmm. And uh, this is going to give black a better, much better middle game. Um, and so, again, I mentioned it in the previous one, and it just, I wanted, I like to give themes because even if there are many themes we can focus on a game, anytime we have a, a theme of a lesson helps us, you know, maybe put it into action a little more. And bringing the C pawn up and these queen pawn lead centers as white as black, as white and black, that's a new one. And if you play this way, by the way, and you bring the knight out, this is just, it's great for you. You've got pressure on the center. If they take it, you can have more space and go for a big center yourself. Um, you, can, you can even play knight d7 if we want to have extra support, because if I'm being a little bit inaccurate about the knight c6, in case there's a chance for them to win the pawn, this is still very good. It supports c5, and you can play for e5. And again, this was what I was saying on Discord, build on the tension and make them blink first, like a staring contest, right? Just stare at them, make them take. If they take, they make your pieces better. Your pieces are getting more squares. If they take here, they make your pieces better. You have a huge center. Often when we build on the tension, tension the first person to break is, is giving up something. So, um, and uh, and there we go. So, all right. You, but you already knew that, right? And, and Knight G4, I think you kind of knew, like you were going for a threat, but you kind of know it's like hope chess, and those are the things we want to we want to avoid. Does that make sense? Yep, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so you play Z4, you play Knight D7, H3, you go back. That was a very heads up play. You saw that he was going to fork you, right? Yeah. Nice. We were nervous about that on the broadcast with Hikaru. You played a good move. Rook c1, and then this was that final moment of tension where taking only gives him more. It increases his center with two pawns. You make his structure better. You give him the c4 square. So another example of tension. We want to build. We want to build on it and make them break the tension. How can we do that? C5 still a good move. It's supported. Mm -hmm. It's a very common good move. Whenever you have a queen's pawn led game, c5 would have been a good tension builder. Believe it or not, okay. Not right away, because there is a threat of e5. But if you defend the pawn, one move you can build up to, and sometimes it's like f5. Again, adds tension. If they take, they improve your position. They open up things and bring pieces in. If they push, that's why I said you had to defend the pawn first, as ugly as it looks to lose a tempo, his pawns are bad, and he doesn't have anything anymore. The position is super closed and super solid for you. So... Good examples of be patient when it comes to the pawns and, and bring attackers to them. Make them make them blink first. This move here and then f5 goes the other way because you, you increase their options and never defended the pawn. And that's how this move got you in trouble. After that, it kind of unraveled very quickly, actually. So you saw this f5 idea. You just, just needed to defend this move first. Or, um, or again, theme of the day for whatever reason... Queen's pawn led centers. We're going to push our C pawn forward. Mm. Yep. Awesome. Crazy, crazy. All right, so kind of got tough from there. Um, you tried still to leading. Cheer. What? We're still leading. Sorry. I'm almost That's done. Okay. That's okay. Take your time. Take your time. I know. You need to, you need to fuel up. I need to feel better. <laughs> um, I just need you to like run my diet, so I can build muscle. You know. I mean. Yeah. I mean. Yeah. I mean. I, I don't. Yeah. I mean, I could. I would definitely help you, even though like I'm not like a nutrition coach, but I know a lot about nutrition, obviously. Mm. I like that shirt, by the way. That's nice. Thank you. Thank you, man. Appreciate it. I got it um, from a friend. It's nice. They make this these t-shirts. All right. Sorry about that. Almost done. So yeah. Take, um. Take take your time, man. Take your time. What are you eating? What are you eating, by the way? I just finished this. I've had it open for a long time. Finally, RX bar is done. Done, so. Are you still eating the protein bar, man? What the? They're, f they're, they're hard to. One one hour to eat a protein bar. What's well, going it's, on? It's a chewy protein bar, and it was it's got chocolate. It's stuck in my teeth, and 
<laughs> you know, this I know. <laughs> All right. So Queenie Eight was played, and then we then we, that was kind of the final final yeah. moment that lost to Epon. But I think overall, again, these games were were closer than the final results. We know that that first one could have been real good for you if you went after the D five pawn. But even after that. As long as you hadn't traded the queens and the rooks as he was under time pressure, you were doing okay. And this one here, honestly, I feel like you're just a, a pawn structure knowledge thing away from being completely on an equal footing with him. Just just knowing not to break it and to build on the tension with C5 or, or even just, like we said, like keep the F5 idea in mind, but but make sure we're aware of our, our, our opponent's incoming threat, right? And that's... But these were very close after that. Sometimes we make a small mistake and the position just unravels super fast. You know, and that's kind of what happened here. So, so yeah, there you go. And um, and that was it. So, so all right, I'm going to invite you now to a new analysis board, a fresh analysis board. And we'll just talk uh, a little bit about how we want to yeah, continue wanna, the lesson here. Um, absolutely. So how are you feeling right now? We just did a lot of deep diving on the games, right? I finally finished my protein bar, thank God. Um, That's nice, man. <laughs> and how are you? How are you feeling right now? I'm feeling good. I feel good. I feel good. I just want to thank Corn and Chesty for you know subscribing. Thanks for subscribing, guys. Appreciate you guys. Uh, but yeah, I feel good. I feel good. Okay. Yeah. Cool. So. You? All right. So um, we've uh, you've been practicing a ton. Right, way to be on it. You've been playing against a stronger opponent, right? That's how we get better. And I, I've uh, been playing, but you know, I would not say ton because I've heard guys that, you know, are doing eight, six hours a day, and you know, yeah, I'm not doing that. But I'm, I'm probably spending like two hours a day doing doing chess, yeah, for sure, two hours maybe. Okay, good. What other tools are you working through besides playing? Are you are you do you have the time? Are you spending time to reviewing the honest, game? To be honest with you, I've been playing mostly, but I've also been doing some puzzles as well. Okay. Um, puzzles are great. Uh, the um, Okay. The, the main thing I wanted to make sure, because of the, you know, the fact that I know you're going to face some different openings that aren't just E4, E5, is that you've got... You know, you've got kind of the plans now we talked about when we face um, something that's not E45. I feel pretty good about the Italian. We, we've gone over it a few times, and, and you've, you know, you've done pretty well. You've, you've, got, you've gotten the system that, you know, that you know, and, and we've talked about the plans. I think C6 is one we just learned from, so what are we going to do next time against the Caro? Boom. They give you the center. You take, take it, the right? And D5 has played multiple options. Develop the knight. I would say let's not play F3. There's actually a really crazy line there that if we don't know it can be, <clears throat> excuse me, can get into trouble. They can take and play E5, opening up this trick, so that if you take, mm -hmm. they have this and you're you're in big, big trouble. Right? Yeah. Yeah. So, um... So we don't want to play F3, but otherwise, I, pushing the pawn, maintaining space, totally good. Developing to defend the center, awesome. Even taking can the we, pawn. Give me one, one, one second. One yeah, second. yeah, My go for it. Me. Yeah, yes, can I see? No, it's okay. What's up, baby? Everything okay? Really? Shit. Holy shit, Kelsey. Okay, bye, baby. Love you. Okay, I'm back. For a second, I thought there was a problem going on. No, there's no problem. She was just telling me something funny. Okay. <laughs> Good. Um, you can even take and play C4. Um, and... Uh, play against the isolated queen pawn you can develop again anytime the lead pawn in the center is the queen pawn we got our move right mm -hmm. c4 and knight out behind the pawn so every one of those is, is a great option this is actually what i play this is the panopod vinic against the carol con 
taking and playing for D4. Um, but uh, but you can go you can go for any of the things we talk about. So quick reminder on other things we could face. So the French is a similar one that we would not want to play in Italian development. Just like the Karakhan, if we go for it, we're kind of instantly hitting a wall, right? So what do we do against e6? Take the center. We take the center. Awesome. Grab the center when they give it to you, right? Mm -hmm. Um... Now, they can play d5, and again, you have similar options, actually, to the Karakhan. It's actually all three of the same moves as the main options. Knight c3 to defend the pawn. You can also play for e5 to advance the center, right? You can also take and play for c4, actually. Not quite as uh, a main line or mainstream as when you do that against the Karakhan, but, um, but also totally good. And... All right. The, the main thing we're establishing is if we face some kind of random non-E5 opening, you know, we're remembering basic principles come before basic moves, and we don't necessarily play the same Italian move order when it comes to these other systems. Remember, same thing against, against C5. We want to play the knight out. We talked about this. And then you can go bishop C4, but even here... We talked about foregoing it because it's not quite a French, but if you go here and they play e6, it's kind of similar and that we don't have the same effectiveness we normally have, right? With the, like when the bishop is on, the pawn is on e5. So c3, playing for d4 is a move I was giving you to, to prepare to have a big center and wait for, wait for the position to tell you where to bring the bishop, right? Like you can, in some cases, even bring the bishop to d3 and, C2, and c2 behind your center to support it. Um, in some cases, you can you can wait and bring the bishop out to b5. It, it can depend on basically what black does. But you're still going for d4, getting a big center, which if you remember, was kind of like the line I was teaching you to go for in the Italian. Even if they play this way and attack the pawn, you can defend it and slowly play for a big center. So that's an idea we can remember for, uh, for future, right? Yep. yep. Cool. All right. I don't really like doing the kind of grilling of opening ideas when there's there's just so much you can't anticipate, and at, especially at this level, everyone's still kind of learning opening lines and different stuff, but I'm trying to do it in a way that's a bit more of a map to just remembering, you know, principles and ideas before moves. Giving, they give you the center, you take it. You remember the idea of the Italian to play things like for C3 and D4, but, but it can change depending on the type of position. And... Um, and okay, so next I wanted to go back to talking a little bit about d4, meaning when you're black, obviously, right? Um, and like what you did against um, Waga in the second game was great. You developed and eventually, you know, made an exchange. You had a chance to trade. I guess the main positional lesson to take out here is that typically when the queen's pawn leads is the leading pawn, you want to get your pieces out behind the pawn, right? Support the center or undermine the center. Right by moving the pawn first and then bringing the knight out behind it. Cool. Yep. Okay. All right. Um, but in this position, let's let's go back. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. In this position, if I push this pawn up here, he if he takes, I don't have it protected. Wouldn't wouldn't I want to push this pawn up first to have uh, the bishop? To, in this line yeah that's a great point yeah that's exactly yeah. what you'd want to do yeah um, absolutely yeah, yeah moving the pawn up and then playing c5 100 percent what you want to do and yeah. uh yeah. anytime the queen's pawn is the lead pawn it's a great idea again you mm -hmm. don't even have to bring the bishop out first there's risk in that I've, I've showed that in a lot of lines that if they switch bases and go back to c4 and then let's say you try to defend the pawn and bring the queen out, sometimes you end up missing the bishop presence here. You can get in trouble with some tactics. So I know it's counterintuitive to not want to bring out this bishop before we close it in, right? It's hard for us to pull the trigger on blocking the bishop. 
I would say you only want to go for these ones if they're playing the London system, which a lot of people play. They bring the bishop out first. Or let's say you go here, they go here, and they bring the bishop out. If they commit their dark sword bishop, you kind of have the time to do the same, you know? Um, but otherwise, if they're playing a traditional sort of queen's gambit declined, like with this move, then what you want to do is you want to defend... Like, like we talked about, and you don't need to bring the bishop out here outside the pawn chain because of the risk it, it brings to your um, your queen side over here. Does that make sense? Cool. Absolutely, but, but cool. in this position, wouldn't, wouldn't I just want to take this pawn? You can. In fact, we... So, the main idea of the queen's gambit is that they're baiting you, you to take wanna, this you want You want to hold the center. I understand that. Yeah. And yeah. what, what they're doing is they're baiting you to take under the idea yeah. that they're going to develop, get a big center, and eventually take the pawn back. So you'll lose it anyway, and in the process, you've given up the center. So uh, there there are lines where you can prepare to take it. Instead of defending with the e-pawn, you can also defend with the c-pawn. Now you're giving up on the idea of c5, which is actually fine, because they committed first. I mean, white goes first, they have the opportunity to gain that tempo, and, um, and so you kind of have to defend. In these lines, if they don't properly defend the pawn, there's very often much more aggressive ideas to take. And the main reason is that c6 supports b5. So if they try to go back for the pawn, you have ideas like b5 in a lot of these positions, and you're fully you're fully holding on to the pawn over here. Mm -hmm. So um, the uh, so there you go. Mm -hmm. Does that make sense? Yep, it does. It does. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. A lot um, of good stuff. A lot of good stuff. All right. Let's, yep. let's have you Maybe. play. I mean, I don't know how long you have. And, you know, we've got a good reset here. Feel strong before whatever you could face tomorrow with Austin. But why don't we have you play a game or two like we've done and just try to try to slow down a little bit in the opening just to make sure you execute on the things that we said. And normally, I would say play fast. But just to make sure that you execute on the tactics that we're doing right now. or Sorry, not the tactics. The move orders in the opening. Let's make sure we get the openings we just talked about, and then and then go from there. Absolutely, I would I would love that. Yeah, okay, cool. Do. So I'm gonna make sure I'm following you. Um, Should I do something again? Yeah. At what time control do we want to play again? Uh, it's up to you, man. Ten I minutes. Think. Five minutes. Ten minutes is pogs, pogs champs. Just a little longer, right? Um, mm. We could play Maybe one one ten minute game with each color. One with white. One with black. Um, we can do that. That's like that's similar to park champs. Okay. I mean, in 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 in, in park champs, we play ten minutes with five seconds. Uh, added yeah, yeah. And smooth. But we can like ten minutes. I think that's long enough. Um, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, sure. I I let's let's do ten minutes. I've been doing more five minutes uh five minutes games, you know. But okay. Yeah, I want to. Yeah, let's, let's ten, do, let's minutes ten minutes is close to what you know, right? Uh, yeah. For for Pog Champs, so go for it, yeah. I'm gonna go for it. Go for it. Awesome. Here we go. Against Random X from Germany. Alright, now we'll get our Italian. All right, keep playing. I'm stepping away real quick to the bathroom. I'll be right back. Sounds good, man.
All right, we're back. How we doing? Back, champ. What's up, champ? How was your um? It was good. Good little bathroom how was your, run. How, how was your house break? It was good. Yep. It's good. good. Not as no, good. As, not as good not, as your game, though. No, I'm just gonna check my thing. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> not as good yeah. as your game. The bathroom run was good, but your game was better. Uh, yeah, nice. That's true. Um, yep. we've, uh, let's back up and take a look at it. There are, there are a couple yep. things to, uh, to learn here. Let me, uh, can I, can I tell you one move that I'm, that, that I miss saw yeah. in the game, um, that I would, I want to play and you tell me if you would like, let, just go, go forward, go forward. Well, go yeah. ahead. I, I just invited you to the board. So now you can move the pieces. How can I go for? Oh yes, yeah, so I'll do it. So here, here. Okay, okay, yeah. So he takes, I take. He bring it. He brings. I would want. Oops, I would want move this piece up. Like my pawn, like my pawn to. Uh... To e5. Yeah. Yeah, that definitely would have been a uh, a fork, right? Yeah. Um, and so you saw that in hindsight. I saw that after my play, yeah. Nice. Okay, yeah. cool. Um, I was too worried of, of, of him, uh, his rook, attacking my pawn here. I was just like, he has a free pawn. So I, was, I have to protect it, but I, I should have just pushed it. Right. Right. So um, I do want to back up a second, too. Because remember, yep. back here, you were in a regular Italian. And in the future, when we get these, we want to bring our bishop out first to c4. All right. Before going for c3 and d4. That's an All idea right. that I really want you to remember against the Sicilian. Against the Sicilian, we play for the c-pawn. That's how we'll remember it first. Right. In, in the main line, keep doing your Italian because it's going great. Bring the bishop out to c4 first and then go for the plan of c3 and d4. Even if they attack the pawn... You can play d3, get castled, and kind of slow play it. Because it's a plan they can't really stop. In, in this particular game, we played c3, and then we played d4. And it, it could have got a little tricky here if they take here. Now, it's funny. It's actually, it's actually still not bad for you. If you play this move d5 and kick their knight, you can actually win back your pawn in a lot of positions. But it's very, it's very tricky. And it's not really the opening we know. So... Um, c3 in this move order in the future we should play bishop c4 but after that you did get a big center it was great and yes if you had played e5 early this would have been this would have been even better now it doesn't actually win a piece so I, I, people in my chat were yelling that you should have played it too but the truth is even if you play it it doesn't win a piece he could still play bishop b4 check now now you can develop and and you're better it is a good move for you but just so you know, you didn't actually miss a win of a piece because he does have this. So, so you can I, I mean honestly, your move bishop d three is not that bad. Um, it supports the center and e five is even more powerful now because of this move coming. I mean, meaning the diagonal. So, yes, you should learn because you missed e five. You you don't want to miss things like that. But just so you know, you didn't really miss an opportunity. I think bishop b three was actually a very good move. Okay. So, bishop d3, bishop b4, you play bishop d2, you develop actively in castle. This is great for you. d5, e5. I mean, honestly, I, I kind of have a feeling I had to use the restroom, but I kind of knew this wasn't going to be a long game. You, you're in a great spot here. a3 is is a good move, but I want to pause here. This is this is one great moment from this game. This is an, such an important tactic for, for you to familiarize yourself with that we're going to pause here. So... A3 is a fine move. We already know this one went well. You develop the attack strongly, taking advantage of h7, because whenever you have a pawn on e5, there's no knight on f6, so our alarm bells have to start going off. But in terms of like the ultimate alarm bells, you should always look for this tactic to work that I'm going to make you, make you find here. So this is called the Greek Gift. In this position, white actually has a very strong combination to launch a mating attack, that is a pattern you wanna you wanna memorize. So take a moment and think about how aggressive you might be able to be. Push yourself to be really aggressive in terms of how you think about the uh, the king side here. Um. Oh. 
on Hastings side. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can be super aggressive and just like make a check, make a. That's a good move. Queen C2 is yeah. a good move. There's an even more aggressive one, and here's the clue. I mean, I can move my knight. Up, knight G5 no. is the so you're getting closer. Okay, so Queen C2 is yeah. one. Knight G5 is even more direct, and it double attacks the pawn and it opens the queen. But let me put this in your head: if you could imagine the knight and the queen over here working together. Would you really even need anybody else to finish off the checkmate attack? So in this position, there's a way to do the same idea of knight g5 and queen out, but do it in an even forcing manner, an even more forcing manner, which is the tactic. So say, say, say this again? So um, if you have a knight and a queen against a kingside mating net, especially if this h-pawn is gone, Usually, that's that's the kind of mating net that is really hard to stop. So, are you saying that you want to sacrifice sa sacrifice my my my? Boom, Daddy. That's exactly what I'm saying. Oh. And that's the that's the the Greek gift. Now, people in my chat are saying that they don't think it works here. I actually think it does. I don't have an engine, but either way, I'm gonna I'm gonna actually I'm gonna actually try it. Okay. In in the future games, if I ever enter in this position, I'm going to take this pawn. I've thought about it in some games because I think, well, he has to take with this king or move here. I mean, his better move would probably to move. You don't want to just like open your king up. Yep. Like he's just so open. Uh, so like it's probably better to move because then you have to move again and. You know, but in that case, you've stolen a pawn, right? And get out, and his king is wide open. Um, true, true. So it's actually a nice. Um, nice. Yeah, I kind of, I kind of um, just uh, what would you say? I like. Well, I'm going to play it out. Idea I'm... because I've thought about it, like in like I've thought about it in my lessons, not in like my lessons in games that I played. But I've not never played it because in my mind I was always I, I knew it would weaken his uh, king if he would take. But I always thought, well, I'm losing a my, piece. my a piece, a good right. piece. And that's um, that's a totally fair mindset. So let let me show it because again, it's a mating pattern, and just because it's a pattern doesn't mean it always works. But we're gonna try to learn some criteria here because there are like actually, actually, like if I take here, mm -hmm. if he would take, yeah, let's go and do it. I would, I would, I would, I would yep, check. He would go here. Uh, there's his checkmate coming up. Just checkmate coming up right away. Yep. If he goes back, this is the this is the. This is the... the... He can't even take this rook because I'm going to take it here. Yep, you have a queen. So this yeah. is the power version of the pattern. And let me show you the whole pattern before we talk about other things that could happen. So you're threatening queen h7. The only way to deal with this mate is either to give up the queen, which they can resign, or to move the rook and try to run away. And the key point to the pattern is, is before you go here, you take with check first to open up the seventh rank. And then you go back... Then you do the same thing, and now you've cleared the second rank, sorry, the seventh rank, so then the end, you have checkmate. So let me let me show you the whole thing start to finish again. So Because this is the first pattern to, like, memorize. We're, we'll talk about some exceptions. In fact, the best way for black to play is to try to bring the king forward. But before we get into that, first we got to know the main pattern. It's to take and play knight g5. They have to go back. If they go to h8... You go, you go here, and it's just checkmate next move. So this is the move. You go here. You're threatening mate. The only way out, knight f6 delays it by one move, but then you can take it, and it's checkmate next. So again, the only way out is they run the rook, and before you play queen h7, you take here first, and then go back and deliver the goods. This particular mating pattern is one that you like. You want to memorize as a chess player. It's, it's a very well-known tactic that often occurs whenever there's no knight on f6 and you have a pawn on e5. Now, now if the bishop is here, it doesn't work anymore because the bishop guards it. So, for example, after the move you play in the game, it's no longer an option. Now taking would just be bad because this move is just met by captures. We're just we're losing everything. Mm -hmm. So that's why it, it, it works right here, right now. Now, a lot of people in my chat are yelling at me 
to say that it doesn't work because the king can come forward in this particular line. Now, regardless of whether the king out survives better, which it almost always does for black. Like, if you ever fall for this yourself, Thor, my advice is don't go back and just let them clean house. Because if you go back, you're just resigning to the mating net. And, and it almost works every time. Very hard to defend. But you should almost always look for an opportunity to come forward. Now, the reason I think this is going to work here, and again, I don't have an engine, but just knowing all the tactical patterns, there's certain criteria I look for as to why this should work now and not. One thing is... So, he's still undeveloped, and there aren't as many pieces to defend against some logical ways we could bring more attackers in. Even moves like F4 are on the agenda for me. Even moves like H4 are on the agenda. Now... The thing that's tricky is, I, I don't know that it's a home run, because if we play h4, he can actually take here. And one of the common tactics that makes it work is that you have an h5 check, and when they go here, you have a bishop that moves this guy with a discovered check. In this particular position, that doesn't work because of the awkwardness of the trade here of, of the two bishops. If this, if this bishop were actually on c1, I think it's actually even more of a home run for white. So that's a little tricky and makes me not want to play f4. Or sorry, h4. But you can do other things here that are, that are going to be very good for you. For example, just queen c2 check. In some cases, chat who's wondering, why, does it, why do I think this is going to work and not in the other lines? There are cases where the knight is gone, all right, but you don't have these checks because the bishop can develop and your whole attack comes to an end. In this particular position, the reason I think the criteria was going to work is because I looked at it and, and you look at the inability for black to quickly bring defensive reinforcements. Now, they can play f5. But already you're in a position where you can start winning back material. Uh, there's 96 forks you can actually take with en passant. The king moves, and it's just, I mean, I don't know. I mean, it feels super dangerous. There's knight here, check. Um, there's even simple moves like knight to c3. You bring in another, another attacker to develop, combined with threats of knight d5 and bringing other rooks over. This is not a position you want to play black. Uh, by any stretch of the imagination. And again, worst case scenario, white is already in a position to win back material. You get a rook and a couple pawns with an open king. So I would play bishop takes h7 here, check, and ask questions later. Because there's enough criteria here that if he brings the king out into the wild, I'm sure we're going to get a lot. One thing that sometimes we look for is this move. And we'd love that to work, but black actually has a really irritating defensive resource here. Um which is this move. A discovery on the queen. So we can't take the knight, they win the queen. And we can't move the knight with check anywhere because they win the queen. So it's actually really irritating. We'd have to play a move like this, which, by the way, I'm not even sure that black is out of the woods yet. This is still super tricky. If they take here, you have this check, and you're going to win the queen. Um, if they move the knight to like a random safe square, you also have that check. So now what, they have to run? And you're just like winning your piece back. So I actually don't even... I mean, maybe Queen G4 works. It's crazy, right? So, again, like, I don't have an engine. We don't need it. Because the instructive point I'm making is 100% accurate and relevant. Which starts with this. Whenever you have this pawn on E5, those alarm bells should be going off. You should calculate it and see it through. Like, don't play it blindly. For example, as I said, in the game, when the bishop's on E7, you no longer have it. And you can't go for it anymore, right? It's, it's not there. So that's a very simple criteria where despite everything else looking good and it looks like you have it, you just don't have it. There are criteria that will tell you that it's not there. But in this particular position, it's pretty clear that one, if they go backwards, that's the first thing you always check, that the mating net works. This is the tip. This is the Greek gift net that you're never going to forget after this lesson. And usually there are some criteria to say you have enough here. One of them is how quickly are they bringing in defensive reinforcements? Two, do you have a forcing way, like, immediately? Like, you wouldn't always have this check um, to get back some material if you needed. And the other thing is you just, you calculate concretely. If, again, if this bishop was on c1 and there was no trade, h4 would just be, like, crushing here. Because there's no way to deal with the threat of h5, really. And the king is, is in a huge, hugely tough spot. But even with the move I said, when queen g4 starts working, this just looks crazy I mean, they're just, they're just, they're just, they're just, they're just crazy busted. So, um, anyway, so that's the net. The bishop takes h7, knight g5, Greek gift mating net, forevermore. I have dubbed thee 
you will never forget that and you will see it if it's there and you'll you'll nail it it's gonna be awesome first time you get it and it works you're just gonna you're gonna be all tingly inside i'm telling you it's awesome it's awesome right all right cool stuff very cool very cool stuff um uh, all right so you played a3 like oh sorry you played a3 which was good you know again you still have a this is a great position like i couldn't ask for better center i mean you're develop. You, you played great but it's just funny there were just a couple of instructive tactics in this game mainly this great gift that will be helpful for the future a6 you won a pawn and then you brought the queen in i mean you were an animal this game i mean honestly like that was just that's a 15 move win that's called a miniature right that's a miniature you just won a miniature i love it yeah I mean, my my opponent wasn't the best, but you know, I still won. So that's a winner, so winner, so win. You know, hopefully yeah, next game I'll, I'll I'll get a better opponent. You know, it's gonna give me more more uh, more work. All right, cool, man. Um, do you want to play one more as black, sure. or or are you done? I'll play one more. Okay, let's do it. So go ahead and start another one. Hopefully, you get black. I guess. I guess in theory, you could search a game and you may not get black. Oh, I'm fucking white. <laughs> okay. No worries. Just play it. We'll do one more as white. I know it was a difficult. It was a, it was a strong move on my my half. There's a thing for a while. Maybe this internet is going off. Maybe, maybe this Wi-Fi is bad. Who knows? Show us the cat. Loki! Loki! I still haven't moved. Where's Loki? All right. No, I mean, it was a good move. I mean, you know, it's a, it's a huge pressure. Yeah, he's clearly in trouble. So, Danny, what 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 are you doing your on your in your uh, spare time? Um, well, I have four kids, so like I like we said, that's you know, it's a lot of things to do. Um, but my my hobbies, I guess, I exercise every day. I've I've kind of hit a wall right now with all the pandemic stuff. I'm not really going to CrossFit anymore because a lot of the gyms are closed. So I do my own workouts, which ends up being just kind of a lot of body weight stuff and fun stuff because I need to clear my head. But it's not like the it's not like the lifting aspects of working out, right? Um, and I don't really have a hugely complex home gym. Um. But we play we play table tennis at my house, ping pong. So we're pretty good at that. My kids are getting better, but I can still beat them with my left hand. So that's their goal, is to try to nice. beat dad. And then I switch to my right. So that's what I'm working on right now, um, or the, what their kids are working on. Um, otherwise, you know, I'm kind of a workaholic. I mean, that's the truth. Sometimes people ask that, and, and, and in some ways I say it like, with I'm very fortunate because, you know, I'm I was a professional chess player turned into like, you know, 
having the luckiest job any chess business person ever could have, right? I literally, you know, am an owner and run like the world's largest chess company, you know? So I'm awesome. the, tr the truth is I'm just like super fortunate. I mean, I, I'm the kind of guy who most of the time the wife and kids go away. I'm like, okay, great. I've got like an hour to open my computer and answer emails or, you know, get back about a feature that we're developing or, you know, Review, re review cheat detection because people are cheating all the damn time you know just so i'm kind of it doesn't do people, mean that every how, do you have like a system that you can see that people cheat in chess can you see yeah that? our algorithm is is super it's many years of investment it's super advanced um the best way to describe it i always tell people as what kind of has separated over time is the effort we put in when people aren't cheating and what that means is like it's like, you know, what they what they do in the IOC, right? How do you, like, properly test blood doping? You can't always do it just by testing when you think someone is on, is, is, is blood doping, right? Because you don't have a baseline of what their white, you know, what their white blood cell count is or the normal level of oxygen they have in their veins. You really can understand what someone's DNA is when you're testing them all the time and even when they're clean. Does that make sense? So, like... So, like, if Hoftor, like, suddenly started playing, like, an engine one game, we have so many games of yours on our site that we've already run through cheat detection because we're doing it all the time, that when you, if you started playing very quickly as, like, so basically a pattern of, of a profile in your blood that says your DNA is like this, that if you start hitting certain anomalies, we know very quickly that somebody is using outside influence. And... And so that's one of the best ways to describe it without revealing more of like the secret sauce. And from a title player perspective, it's very hard because the best players in the world are supposed to play like engines. They study with engines, right? So how do you hold it against someone when what they're doing is what they're supposed to be doing, which is playing the best move? But even then, the work that goes into just um, to analyzing games and looking at what the, the best you know, games are and, and what they're capable of and, and being able to detect when things go go awry, so to speak. It allows you to more quickly arrive at answers faster than, than people would really need to be accurate because anyone can, like, stand on social media and claim that someone cheated against them, but not many people can go to court and defend that in, like, a defamation lawsuit, right? And that has to be our job is that if we close someone for cheating, that, you know, that we're ready to go to court. <clears throat> so, so that's what we do. And it's complicated, but we're better at it than people think, unfortunately. And I mean that unfortunately, because people keep cheating. And really? um, yeah, and we don't handle it in a public manner, which people criticize us for on occasion, because they think it's our job to make a moral stand and, and publicly defame people. But it's easy for people to say when, you know, if you attack someone's livelihood, even if they broke the rules there's a chance you could be sued and, and lose, right? You can be right and lose in court, which a lot of people forget, or lose where it matters, meaning you can lose money because you defame someone. We have closed a lot of people from cheating, way more grandmasters and players in the top 100 in the world than, than people would know. But the way we handle it often leads to confessions and then second chances where people don't cheat again once they know that we can. And that's kind of the route we've taken to slowly try to win the war rather than every single PR battle. So anyway... That's the long and short of it, but it is an unfortunate amount of what I do at chess.com is oversee our fair play division. Hmm. That's... I know, it's distracting you. No, it's okay. It's, okay. it's not distracting me. Yeah, actually a little bit, but, but it's... Uh... <clears throat> Does that make sense? Did you like that? Like that comparison, though, to like blood Absolutely. doping and stuff? Absolutely. Oh fuck! I played the sorts of blood move. You're right. You have a recovery move if you see it. If he finds it. If he finds F6, you've got a recovery move. Yeah, he saw it. Oh, I want to fucking hit you then. Okay. I yeah, you've got a, you've got a savior if you find it. Uh,
Takes again. No, I don't take. If he takes, I take. If he takes, I take. Oh, fuck, I fucked up. Oh. Well, let's hope he takes my knight. If he takes my knight, I can take. I don't think I can do it more. God damn it. What's up? Nothing, I'm just tar talking to myself. Uh, about. Doing all right. Stay with it.
Nice. Nice. <laughs> Gonna be a fun one. Gonna be a close one. Shit. So close, so close. Ah, I played well again. You played well. That was a close one. Um, second game is white, but we'll take a look at it anyway. I think, I think uh, you showed some good pre-move skills there in the end. You were playing pretty fast, right? To try to not lose on time. Try. Yeah. That's, that's good practice either way, because you might be in cases like that. and you know. So you started out good. Um, remember, again, that these three moves first, the knight and bishop out, you know, complete the Italian setup before you go for c3 and d4 is the, is the, best, thing, the best thing to do. So, so you played c6 and then d5. It was funny. You guys were copying each other here for a little bit. Um, you took, traded, and then knight f3, and ultimately, pretty equal position to start. You end up winning the pawn, which is, which is good, and it, it actually comes with the the second pawn. You, you could have even taken right away, the c4 pawn there. Ultimately, just so you know, I mean, like for Black to keep copying you is not a good idea for them. I mean, copycat openings pretty much always go wrong for Black. It's just a matter of at what move number, because Black is down a tempo, um, so they shouldn't do it. And uh, 
I would say you could have even initiated the trade if you wanted to ruin their right to castle. It's not a big deal, but um, ultimately you win the e pawn and we're better heading into the end game. Um, I think that it, it ended up it did end up being a missed opportunity that you didn't take the pawn earlier, because it would have been a second pawn, and I would argue, even more importantly, it helps it helps bring your knight to um, sorry here helps bring your knight to d6, which is a great square, uh, outpost square supported by your pawn right you've got this you've got that feels good um but again you were playing fast so i don't i don't want to spend too much on this because you know you started out pretty well i think that as um once once we've reached here i wanted to like quiz you on do you remember we just played it so do, do you remember a little bit of what you were thinking here in regards to your plan how did you feel about your position? What what were you recognizing about things at this point? I think my position was crap. I thought this was. Um... Oh, so you didn't like your position? I just, just I just didn't like my pawn structure. You know, everything was yeah. just so open, and my my like I, had, I had I had to get my king away. Um, I think that uh... I th I think you definitely. Yeah, it was clear you really weren't happy with your king position, which is why I suggested, you know, you could have done the same thing by maybe trading him. But but I want to say that you were actually fine. I mean, honestly, your king position was fine. I think you got you got kind of defensive minded and started worrying about this, but but I think you were okay. And the other thing I wanted to point out is that even after you missed the chance to take the pawn and you got your king safe, where where is your advantage in this position? Like where are your advantages? Um, up a piece you're up a pawn right oh. and where is that pawn what what area of the board it's um his uh d square the oh so that's where extra pawn is yes but if we talk about your pawns where is your extra pawn currently on the board? Well, I have a pawn on C and E. I have these pawns here. Right, and if we count, if we count the queen side, we've got four pawns versus four pawns. If you count the king side, you have four pawns versus three pawns. Mm -hmm. It's important to recognize that because that's where your advantage is. You have a majority on that side of the board a pawn majority is usually your biggest advantage it's once you've won a pawn that's where you want to flex is on that side of the board because that's where you can you can cause problems for them because you have more than they do right you can play f4 here and try to play f5 and try to kick them back try to try to use the fact that you won that e5 pawn all the way back on move eight when you took it I actually and I thought about thought about that that move, but I thought okay. to myself, uh, I'm opening up my king so much. Yeah, and that's fair. Good to think about. I think the main lesson I would offer in counterpoint is that the queens are off the board. You're not really in danger of a mating net here without the queens on the board. Yeah, true. true and I think true, true. I I think that's a good lesson, even all the way back to like here, where you just got you just got real worried about your king position, which is good. I mean, I'm yeah. glad you're aware of. The potential difficulties there but for several moves and even here you still could have taken the pawn and i would ask like where's the pressure right optically it doesn't feel good but it's also no, true true I feel that. Yeah. right and so that's a good lesson i think that just know that if the queens are off the board your king is not as in danger as much danger as you thought the last thing i would say is that in addition to playing f4 when he played b5 do you know the move you could have played right here only because he played this do you remember on passant Yeah, true. And, and that's important because if you did that, you actually could have had a, a one last chance to win that pawn again, and you would be up two pawns now, an extra pawn over here, an extra pawn over here. So I had to remind you of that, even though I kind of felt like the bigger coaching lesson I wanted you to think of was your majority. But in the specific game here, I think that remember on passant because you might get it again in pod champs, right? Don't ever forget when you have that opportunity to take on passant. Okay. 
Absolutely. After that, I mean, things were okay. He when he played night D seven, I think you were you were still kind of like recovering a little bit because you had felt that your position was worse before, and and you you were already kind of missing some tactics here. Like like he could have taken right away, he didn't. He played this, and then he could have taken again, he didn't. You saved the night, but um. But I think I think uh, don't overreact when your king loses the right to castle if the queens are off the board. And and focus on your strengths a little bit. In this game, you were you were very defensive-minded for whatever reason. I think it was because of the queen trade. It kind of set you on your heels, and you were psychologically focused on, on like, that you, you didn't really like your position for the rest of the game, even though I was watching it. Like, your position was still pretty good. You could have won that C4 pawn for many moves, and you had a majority. But the fact that you were kind of, like, missing tactics here, that's not like you. Normally, you see things like this. And, and so you were, I could tell you were a little bit, like, thrown off. Um... And that's ultimately what led to this mistake. After f6, you had one last chance to save the piece. You could have played bishop e3, removing the fork and hitting this knight. So then it's an eye for an eye. And and that was a move that you, you didn't see. When I was giving you the clue that you still had a chance, this was the move I was hoping for. Yeah, it's frustrating. It's so, it's so it's funny. It's so frustrating when you... When you... Just, you just don't do this most, but yeah, it's it is what it is. And you're right, right? We're just uh, we're just learning. I'm gonna I'm gonna switch my mic for the people of your chat who want me to have a different mic. Hopefully, that's better for mustard fuzz. I thought you sounded great. I think I sound okay, but they apparently want Absolutely. me to. I mean, I was gonna say we're two hours into the show now, guys. A little late to make a mic change, but okay, I did it anyway. Right. Um, right. Anyway, so you know this would this would have helped, but I, I think the overall psychological lesson from this game is is don't get flustered there, right? You lost the right to castle. It, it kind of um, you kind of uh, you know then we're kind of on your heels, and and I so that's the main takeaway I think for this game. There were some specific tactics. Don't forget on passant. Think about your palm majority. But I, I didn't want to. I don't want to overharp this game because I think really the psychological lesson was you. Got a little flustered there early with the the queen trade and and then you know lost this piece. But so after this, now you like turned it on. It was like you poked the bear. This you know you started getting aggressive with your pieces. You won back some material. Rook d1 was a fantastic move. He needed to bring his rook back. Instead he blunders this. Now who's better? Now you were winning and and even up to like this moment here, you could have done a huge trade if you wanted the rook ending, but you kept the knight on the board, which I think is even better. Um, and you took g7. Now, what's funny here is right here, right now, it would have been good to recognize just how bad his position was because he's even in a mating net. If you could get protection for this rook, you're mating him in two moves, knight f8, knight g6 is mate. Now, you can't do that because the king would take the rook. So the fastest plan here to win, exact, you high, look at you, look at you, you're the man, you highlight it before I could say it, right? And it's a dual threat. Because not only are you going for the mating net, but it also makes sense to push the pawn, right? I mean, makes sense, right? So again, it felt like even when you got the advantage back, this game, you know, I would say take a breath in those moments, right? Don't beat yourself up for previous mistakes because you're still in a lot of these games. And and if you find F4, you're going to win this game for sure instead of E5. F4, he doesn't even have the time to get back. I mean, you're F4 and F5. And yes, there's the mating net, but, you know, or the queen. I think you're just... You're crushing him. Um, you played e5, and then you ran into a dilemma. Now, like, you want to push the pawn, but the knight's in the way. You can't move the knight because the rook hangs. So you had to find this move. And now it got spicy. I know that with best play, you were probably still okay here. Um, you know, something like takes, and then knight c5. You actually stopped the pawn. Um, and you still have this. So that would have been okay. Yes, you just highlighted maybe, maybe a plan over here. Yeah, like knight f8. But this is really risky, right? Because it's actually not so clear what to do here. I mean, if you check and check, he gets out. So actually, I don't think you should go for the net anymore. I think you, I think it probably you have to back up. But, but like I said, I kind of not holding. At this point, you were under time pressure. Very hard to play this position. I think the last big moment was really right here with the F pawn, um, and and then you know he found all the right moves. You want to know what's really funny is if you have this exact position. But your pawn is on h4 guarding g5, so he doesn't have queen g5. 
it's a totally unclear position. So it kind of like, it was a perfect, perfect storm. He was able to find everything. And, and at that point, you know, um, the, uh, the writing was on the wall, but Hey man, this might've been as, as a productive two hours chess lesson as we've had yet. And we've had a few, I feel pretty good about this day. What do you think? I do as well. Yeah, I do as well. I'm going to keep practicing obviously. And, and yeah, just you know, keep grinding. Um, I'm gonna pray, I'm gonna practice a little bit more now before I end this stream. Actually, um, I'm going to because I'm actually competing tomorrow uh, against. That's Austin. right, Austin Show. Uh, Austin Show, yeah. So yeah, I wanna I wanna be prepared. So I'm probably gonna take like three, four games now, and I'm gonna call it a night. Uh, but thank you so much for lesson, man. I appreciate it like always. Well, if you're gonna keep uh, streaming, I'm gonna I'm gonna raid you so everyone can go hang out with you. Oh, thank you so much, my friend. Appreciate appreciate that, man. Uh, All right. Always always a pleasure. Um, I mean, appreciate you taking the time to help me 